Ah uh, yes, the city of Grand Rapids in western Michigan, hosting a population of a million in the metro area. This city lies right on the Grand River and today you can go see the beautiful rapids in which the city shares a name. Wait. Bliss! Where are the rapids? Bliss, where did they go? Bliss, I know you have them. Where are the rapids? Van Andel Arena, Woodland Mall, and the inevitable back-to-back crash-inducing traffic on Alpine, all of which are staple parts of the Grand Rapids experience. Surprisingly, these haven't been around forever. Rather, there was once a time when the area around the Grand River only had forests and not a single road which lacked obvious forethought on the amount of traffic. Humans have likely been involved in the area for a few thousand years, but there wasn't a regular set of inhabitants until the Ottawa got kicked out of Canada by the English and French settlers that came down into Michigan in the 17th century. And probably kicking out whoever lived there, but we don't need to talk about that. The the Ottawa got their name from the word Adawa, meaning traders. They spent their time collecting pelts to sell to European fur trappers. Settling along the Grand River allowed for an efficient source of water for their agriculture and, if they were feeling kind of frisky that day, efficient river trading. European missionaries and traders had been visiting the Grand Rapids area for a couple of hundred years before the first trading post was set up by the La Frambois family in 1806. This post, built near modern-day Ada, was operated by Joseph and Madeleine La Frambois. While on a trip to and from Detroit, Joseph got killed on the way back, as you do near Detroit, but Madeleine happened to be a cunning businesswoman, maintaining that trading post and building several others along the Great Lakes region. Her business even became a direct competitor to John Jacob Astor, the owner of American Fur Company, and then richest man in America. You might have heard the name before because one of Astor's descendants died on the Titanic. She eventually took her riches and settled on Mackinac Island, building her mansion, which is now a bed and breakfast, with a one-star review on Yelp. Madeline Law Framboise's most important contribution to Grand Rapids would probably be handing over her trading post to cool dude Ricks Robinson. And believe me, Ricks Robinson was a cool dude. He not only operated the trading post in modern-day Ada, but would grow to operate more than 20 more along Lake Michigan. He'd become so connected that he'd be summoned to a Michigan constitutional convention and become a state senator. As senator in the late 1840s, he attempted to push for the women's right to vote in Michigan. Michigan. Let me say that again. My man, Ricks Robinson, was pushing for equality back in the 1840s while slavery still existed alive and well. He would also be nominated for the governorship, but turned it down. Why would he turn down such an important position? Because he didn't like the idea that his Native American wife might be treated differently than a white first lady. Man, I really like cool guy Ricks. At the same time Ricks was counting his profits along the Grand River, General Lewis Cass, governor of the Michigan Territory and future United States Secretary of State, sent Isaac McCoy to build a Baptist mission in the area. He failed the first time. He also happened to be a little bit crazy thinking he'd set up an Indian Canaan in which he would be his leader and the ideas he sparked have been labeled a direct cause of the Potawatomi Trail of Death, but that's neither here nor there. But McCoy came back a second time with the successful preacher Reverend Del Slater and built the first settler structures within the bounds of the modern day city with a log cabin and a schoolhouse. Fun fact, McCoy would also be instrumental in the founding of Kansas City. And threatening Mormons. But that's a story for another time. So then there's this guy, Louis Campau, who was getting quite bored managing the first training post in Saginaw, and he rushed out to the Grand Valley area to start surveying for a future village of his creation. In 1831, he purchased 72 acres of land along the Grand River for this potential settlement. All he needed now was a name for the young settlement. Hmm, there's this Grand River coming through the area, and there's quite a lot of rapids. I think I'll name it. Call it Kent! Campau now has some competition. Man from New York, Lucius Lyon, comes into town with a group of speculators noting the immense value of the land along the Grand River. Lyon and his gang formed the Kent Company with the goal of establishing a settlement just on the north side of Campau's project. By the way, Lyon wanted to name the area Kent after prominent New York jurist and Chancellor James Kent, famous for one of the first widely accepted treaties on American law. Guess who won the argument in the end? Both technically. Campau and Lyon bash their heads a lot. I mean, could you blame Campau though? He comes here first and is trying to establish this town, and Lyon comes here and starts trying to compete, and even rename the city? I mean, the nerve on this guy! Well, they did try to get along for survival stake, but there was this one area where Campau would not budge. By 1835, the settlement had just about 50 people, which might not seem like a lot, certainly not by today's standards, but the building arrangements were enough to cause a problem. See, Campau designed his little village of Grand Rapids to follow the Grand River and traditional Native American routes. Lyon wanted the quickly emerging grid system where everything is divided into simple but boring blocks. At the time, the two villages basically began to interconnect, but the downtown area clearly lied on Campau's side around where Rosa Park Circle is today. And at that time, there was this string of houses that divided Pearl and Monroe. The only way to get to the downtown from Lyon's side would be go to Round Division and down Fulton, and then back around. So the obvious choice to Lyon 
plan was to just tear down a couple houses and have Monroe go straight through. Campau found this idea unacceptable and did everything in his power to prevent its happening. After all, this was his town design. Eventually, Lyon did get his hand on a couple of houses towards the western end of the Pearl Line and got to build his path. But it came in this sort of disjointed angle that would last in the city until the 1960s. They called it the wheel spoke. And I guess you could say that Lyon won in the end when they redesigned the riverside of the city. Around the same time, Campau desired some territory on the west side of the river. And don't worry, he didn't want to trails of tears it like what happened to the Ottawa in Ohio and around Detroit. He sought to buy. And Chief Noonday of the Ottawa was willing to sell. By the way, Chief Noonday served alongside Tecumseh at the Battle of Thames during the War of 1812 and according to some sources, lived to the age of 100. So Campau, all around cool guy Rick's Robinson, Reverend Del Slater, and Noonday's daughter Messa Sanini, I'm gonna call her Messi for short because I can barely pronounce that, all went to DC to talk to President Andrew Jackson about the deal. He initially received the four with little interest. I guess only killing and death piqued Jackson's interest on natives. However, Messi really liked Jackson's suit and asked a tailor to emulate it. At the next meeting with Jackson, and Messi copied everything down to the piece of weed Jackson stuck in his hat, which symbolized the passing of his wife. This struck a chord with the morning man that lied within Andrew has challenged 100 people to duels and is often the face of Native American genocide Jackson, who eventually proved the deal. In 1836, the last of the founding fathers of Grand Rapids came to the city. This time it was a group of speculators led by another New Yorker, John Ball. And John Ball was probably the most politically connected of all of them. Originally, he turned down a deal to buy up land around Detroit, but he got a decent deal from Governor John Barry for 300,000 acres. Think about that. Lion and Kampau are playing with villages and Ball comes in here with 300,000 acres. When he arrived in the area, do you know what he called Grand Rapids? The Promised Land, or at least the most promising for my operations. By 1850, Kampau, Lion, and Ball's lots were joined together to form the city of Grand Rapids with a population of 2,600. Upon its creation, the area became a popular destination spot for European migrants, particularly the Dutch, Swedes, and Poles, whose influence you can still see today. Over time, robust industries did develop. Some are incredibly obvious and to an extent still going on today, and that is lumber and farming. But did you know early Grand Rapids became known for gypsum mining. This salty crystal rock could be used to make stucco or plaster and thus contribute to that style the rich were on the rage about in the Victorian era. It could also balance soil for agriculture, but like, come on, who needs to eat when palaces could be filled with this stuff? But for one particular industry, Grand Rapids earned its nickname, Furniture City. At the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, Grand Rapids furniture makers made a mark on the whole world, and some would go as far to say that their furniture helped spark the colonial revivalism movement in American architecture and interior design. Companies like Baker and Winnicomb began here. Nowadays, Furniture City is all but defunct. Most furniture manufacturing moved to the Carolinas or overseas. But hey, we still got office chairs. Of course, other businesses had success here. Blissel, Meyer, Wolverine Worldwide all began here. There was also this short-lived automobile company known as Austin, which made these highway kings fancy. But by the end of World War I, they went out of business. However, Grand Rapids still manages to make parts for the factories in Detroit, keeping that car dream alive. At one point through all this development, Grand Rapids had two major projects done onto the water. Interestingly, Grand Rapids is the first city in the United States to apply fluoride to the drinking water. <laughs> I love this city. It is really the best city. Also, in an effort to make the transport of logs downstream more efficient, the rapids were removed from the Grand River. Bliss, where are the rapids? I know you have them. Just give them back and everything will be fine. That seems to cover it all. I hope I'm not missing anything. Nope. Nope, not at all. In all seriousness, there is just so much ground to cover in Grand Rapids that doing any more would invalidate the moniker short history. I mean, without being told, think of all the stories. This metro area is huge, with a million people containing not only the center of Grand Rapids proper, Wyoming and Kentwood, but the periphery cities like Ada, Allendale, Byron, Comstock Park, Granville, Georgetown, Hudsonville, Ionia, Jenison, Rockford, Sparta, and Walker, and the Federal Metropolitan Statistical Area, please don't get mad at me, this is what they think, includes the New Holland cities of Holland, Grand Haven, Muskegon, and Zeeland. There's also a bunch of other small townships and villages, but I'm not counting you, Boston and Berlin. Stop naming yourselves after real cities. I have no idea how to end this, so enjoy this montage of famous people from the city arranged to royalty-free music.
the Rapids.